One of the most fascinating aspects of early rabbinic work is a method of interpreting the Torah which is known as Midrash or Midrash. Uh, this is a fascinating approach to the text of the Torah, specifically the first five books of Moses itself, but there are Midrashim on the rest of the uh, Bible as well. Let us understand what exactly is this Midrash and, uh, and how it is understood today. So the golden era of rabbinic hermeneutics, meaning the way in which rabbis understood the Torah, was uh, towards the end of the period we're discussing today. That is between the years 100 before the Common Era and let's say up to about 200 of the Common Era when the Mishnah was redacted. That does not mean to say, however, that all of the texts that are described in Midrash are from that period. Uh, they are really quoting much older statements which had been handed down as part of the oral tradition and then eventually become recorded by a class, uh, a historical period known as the Tanaim and the later class known as the Amoraim. More on that in a few lectures. Uh, so the texts that we're describing today, many of them can be dated with accuracy no earlier than say about the year 100 before the Common Era, but they are quoting much earlier traditions. And we see this, by the way, in other groups as well. Homer, for example, uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, the great classics of Greek um, early literature, were also handed down as oral traditions until they were finally recorded in text. Now the term Midrash is a way of approaching the text of the Torah, of interpreting the text of the Torah. It comes from the word drash, which means to seek out, to request, or to examine. And it is a fascinating and often quite disruptive means of understanding the meaning of the, the Torah text itself. It's really quite creative. In many ways, it's not dissimilar from a lot of modern literary techniques such as deconstructionism and so on. Uh, fascinating ways of reading the text, often reading it with multiple valences in you know, contradictory directions, absolutely fascinating. I should point out, it's very important to understand, that according to Jewish theology, Midrash also comes from Sinai, that it is a, an oral tradition that goes all the way back to the roots of the written text itself, and as such has tremendous importance. However, when you have Midrashim that move in different directions, or Midrashim that seem to be, you know, highly hyperbolic in nature, uh, it, it's, it can be very difficult to understand what exactly they mean. Many approaches, particularly in the modern era, understand the Midrash to be you know, very poetic in nature rather than hard and fast and meant to be taken on a literal level, but I will leave that to the rabbis to figure out. I'm just a regular historian, not a rabbinic authority. So there is halachic midrash and there is agadic midrash. Halachic, it's an adjective in an English form of an adjective based on the word halacha, which means to walk or to travel. And this is the word used for Jewish law. We'll have much more to say about this as halacha is developed and especially when it's codified in the medieval period. At any rate, uh, halachic midrash are uh, midrashic readings of the text by the rabbis that inform how Jews should behave, hence halachic. So, for example, uh, you'll see on the left here is a photograph of an IDF soldier who is wearing phylacteries, or in Hebrew, tefillin. Uh, these are leather boxes that are commonly worn during weekday prayer. Uh, the box on the top contains several scriptural passages, and the box on the left arm also contains uh, scriptural passages, and there is a ritual for wrapping them around the arm and, and so on, and then prayers are read while these are worn. Now, a question might arise, you know, where does all this come from? Right? If you read the Bible itself, it says in Deuteronomy that you shall bind them, which appears to be uh, a reference to the words of the Torah, as a sign upon your hands and as frontlets upon your eyes. Now, what exactly is a sign in your hand? What does that look like? And frontlets between your eyes, what does that mean also? So the Midrash steps in to give us some explanation. Let's have a quick look at one example. You'll note in the picture here that the... Uh, 
the the box of tefillin on the arm is worn on the left arm on the bicep slightly slightly tilted inwards towards the heart and it's worn correctly let's have a look at how we get to that from the midrash so this is from the midrash halacha called sifre which is written on the book of devarim or deuteronomy and i've taken these citations from the amazing website safaria which is an, a fantastic place to get hebrew texts it's huge and free and wide open and i love it so here it is i'll read in hebrew rabbi lezomer al yadcha begova shel yad the torah says that you should wear the tefillin on your hand and that means the high part of your hand. So what would that be? Well, you figure that's up towards the top, uh, maybe perhaps on the bulge of the bicep. But you said it should be on the high part of the hand, um, but maybe it should be on the hand itself. I mean, the text only says on your hand, Talmud Lomar, and it will be for you as a sign upon your hands, for you as a sign and not as a sign for others, right? So you read what's happening here. The Midrash is kind of looking with a microscope at the text itself, and you're trying to figure out, well, where do you put this box? Do you put it on the back of your hand? Do you put it on your, on your forearm? Where does it go? It says, well, it, the, the rest of the text says it shall be for you as a sign, something that's closer to you. So that would mean up here, which is close to the center of my body, myself, my heart, and so on. Okay, interesting. Like the Midrash is investigating and asking. It's not written like, you know, a, a, a series of rules. It's written like a give and take. We'll have more to see about that in the Mishnah. Talmud Lomar, Hadvarim These words shall be on your heart. Davar shekeneged libcha ve'eze zegova shebeyad. Uh, it means that it should be something close to your heart. Where is closest to your heart on your hand? Well, that would clearly be your bicep, right? So here's an example of the Midrash really picking apart the text, finding a couple of words. One is for you, and another one is your heart. Those are one words each in Hebrew because they have prefixes and so on. So that's how you know where the tefillin should be worn. Uh, it doesn't exist in the text itself. You have to, like, unpack the text to get to the meaning of it. Now, let's just go a little further. And Midrash, by the way, goes deep and deep and further and further like you wouldn't believe. Davar Acher, another interpretation. That itself is fascinating. The Midrash will allow multiple interpretations. Al Yadcha Zesmo. When it says on your hand, it means your left hand. <laughs> Why? Ata Omar Zesmo O Enel Yamin. You say it's the left hand, maybe it's the right hand. Afa Pishain Rail Davar Zechel Davar says, okay, I can't prove it to you for sure, for sure, but I can give you kind of an illusion. If you look in the book of Judges, it says, Yada Liated Tishalchena Vyamina Lehimalos Amalim. So then the, the Midrash goes on, I'll paraphrase in English, that in the reference there where Yael uh, kills Sisra by driving a tent peg through his temple, yikes, her hand reaches out to the peg and her right hand is holding the hammer. Ah, so there you go. Whenever it says hand on its own without specif specifying right hand, it must mean it's a left hand. Okay, nice. That's not a proof, but it's at least one example. In number nine, then Rabbi Natan says the same thing, uh, that it combines binding with writing. So that means that the hand that you do the binding with is the same hand that you do writing with. And for most people, that is the right hand. And the Midrash will go on and on. I'm not going to do the last part here, but there's so much of it. What about if you're naturally left-handed? What about if a person is an amputee? All kinds of things like this the Midrash will explore. And of course, this is just the beginning of a long exploration, which you also find in the Talmud. So Midrash is such a clear example of how the rabbis now, as information workers, are teasing out the meaning of the text and providing direct, clear instruction on halakha, how to behave. The other major area of Midrash, and I would... Uh, argue that especially since the Talmud, uh, the Agadic Midrash is, is even more important. Uh, unlike Halakha, which deals primarily with what Jews should do, how they should act, 
Agada, on the other hand, which is related to the word Hagada, like in the Passover Seder, means the telling, refers to how Jews might want to think, refers to lessons of the text, philosophy, history, biography, um, metaphysics, all kinds of things about the text that reveals to us that doesn't necessarily specifically mandate a particular course of action, but does mandate some kind of thought process. So just to give you one example, um, the binding of Isaac, which is described in Genesis 22. So in that passage, when God uh, first approaches Abraham and says, I want you to sacrifice Isaac, the actual text of God's request is a little more specific. It says, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, even Isaac. Now the Midrash asks, why all this detail? Why not just say, take Isaac? What is this business of all these other phrases? So let's look at Bereshit Rabbah. Bereshit is the Hebrew word for Genesis, once again from the amazing Safaria website. And the phrase says, V'yomar kachna es bincham, etc. Take your son, and so on. Amar lo, and by the way, you'll notice that in the printed text, they don't even bother quoting the rest of the verse, because you really should know it. What are you doing this, studying Midrash, if you haven't studied the Torah properly? You've got to know your verses very well. Amar lo, bevakasha mimcha, kachna es bincha. So God says to him, please, take your son. Amar le, train benin isli. So Abraham says back to God, this is not in the biblical text. This is the Midrash interpolating a dialogue that is not reproduced in the biblical text. How to approach that interpolation? Is it imaginary? Is it a thought experiment? Is it actual? What exactly does it mean? Again, you got to ask a rabbi. But God's, and note, by the way, if you're sensitive to language, that this is written in Aramaic rather than Hebrew, uh, which indicates uh, a sense of that it would have been written down in text form, even though it could have been repeated over in Hebrew much longer, further back in history. It was recorded, certainly, in the period when Jews spoke Aramaic uh, more than they spoke Hebrew. At any rate, uh, Abraham says to God, what do you mean? I've got two sons. Which son are you referring to? Right? Don't forget, Abraham has uh, Yishmael, the older son, and Yitzchak, the younger son, Isaac. Amar lo, so God says to him, Es yechidcha, your only son. Right? Remember that the, the text in the Bible said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, even Isaac. So God says to Abraham, I mean your only son. So Abraham doesn't leave it alone. Amar lo, ze yachid le'imo, ze yachid le'imo. God, I don't understand. This one, Yishmoel, is the only son of his mother. And this one, Isaac, is also the only son of his mother. Yishmoel is the only son of Hagar. Isaac is the only son of Sarah. Which one do you mean? Amar lo, asher ahavta. God says, okay, Abraham, the one that you love. Right, so listen to what Avram says. He says, Amar lo, is techumen b'maya? He says, is there, are there limits to emotions? Meaning, is it possible for me to measure which one I love more? You know, if there's a limit to this, I don't know. So, uh, and finally God says to him, Amar lo, es Yitzchak. He says to him, okay, Isaac, that's who I'm talking about. I'm going to keep talking, and meanwhile, I'm going to put the English up here so you can review my translation. But basically, what's going on in this Midrash is God is stretching out the conversation with Abraham, or perhaps we can say that Abraham is stretching out the conversation. The conclusion of the Midrash is that God stretches this out in order that every aspect of this commandment should be cherished, meaning it's a, it's a long, detailed description of what Abraham is supposed to do in order that Abraham should take it very seriously and perform it with great precision. Now, I would like to suggest as well that there are other readings of this Midrash as well, and that's one of the amazing things about Agadic Midrash, is that 
it, it's so rich and and powerfully deep in meaning that you know you can you can really think so many profound thoughts as you try to work through the midrash also note please that the midrash seems to be intrinsically opaque it's not transparent it doesn't give it to you on a on a you know a platter everything the midrash is trying to say requires you to respond to it perhaps this is another way of understanding the word midrash itself it's a it's a it, it's a search it's a journey for meaning it's an attempt to discover something and in that sense midrash is absolutely fascinating and beautiful to study okay let us go on in the next lecture to talk about the mishnah another incredibly important achievement of this particular period of jewish history